Uh, members, we have quorum and we're now in public session. I uh, invite the public to enter the gallery. Okay. So, uh, welcome to today's first meeting of the new mandate. Advise members that all mobile phones should be switched to airplane mode or on silent or turned off. Um, it's not sufficient to put mobiles on silent mode as they continue to interfere with the assembly recording. Uh, in other words, you've in my experience of this committee, if you put them too close to the microphone, they just continually inter interrupt um, and impede the recording. Sessions do also do recorded video and audio and can be accessed by uh, online steam streaming, either on the Assembly website or Democracy Live. Uh, anyone in the gallery, which there isn't at the moment, is welcome to use their mobile devices as they are, uh, as long as they're in airplay mode and all devices are muted. Um, so agenda item three, apologies. Uh, members have received apologies from Mr. Middleton. Are uh, members aware of any other apologies? No. Okay. Item four: uh, contact uh, staff details. Advise members with the details for many of us staff are page 22 to note that the importance of contact staff if you're unable to attend a meeting. Also, staff are there to provide support and advice. Okay. Yep. Agenda item five: committee members. Ask members to note the membership of the details at page 24. Members agreed? Agreed. Yep. Okay. Agenda, agenda, agenda 6. Declarations of members' interest. Can I refer members to the members of the clerk on pages 26 to 27 of your pack? I advise members that all members are required to register relevant financial or other interests in the members' interest, details of which are registered and published on the Assembly web website. And I would remind members that in addition to this requirement, Standing Order 69, brackets 5, states that a member who has A, financial interest in any matter, or B, relevant interest in any matter, must declare that interest before taking part in the proceedings of the Assembly relating to that matter. In particular, there is a requirement to declare any interest which might reasonably be thought to be by others to influence the member's approach to that matter uh, under consideration. And for members, the proceedings of the Assembly includes this committee. Further advise members that this uh, is the uh, first meeting of the committee and members should ensure that any financial or other interests which relate to the remit of the committee or which are likely to be relevant to a substantial part of its work are drawn to the attention of the committee. It should be noted that failure to register and or declare an interest may be an offence under Section 43 of the Northern Ireland Act 1998. Uh, members, I have to ask, does any member have any interest to want to declare? I would remind you that the rules governing the registration and declaration of member interests are contained in the Code of Conduct and Guide of the Rules relating to the conduct of members, and further advice and guidance is available from the Clerk of Standards, Room 254 at Parliament Buildings. Okay. Item 7, Public Accounts Committee Procedures. I refer members to the following documents which are for noting. Guide to the powers and operations of uh, standing and ad hoc committees for chairpersons and members pages 29 to 39, for members to par paragraphs 55 to 57 in respect to privilege under section 50 of the Northern Ireland Act 1998 for the purposes of law of defamation absolute privilege applies to um, the making of a statement of proceedings in the Assembly and publication of a statement under the Assembly's authority. This privilege extends to meetings of this committee. Members should note, however, that the privilege does not extend to the press conferences or statements made to the press. Okay. Um, I refer um, members to paragraph 62-63 in respect of sub judice. Uh, committee members should be aware of the potential <coughs> problems associated with discussing a matter that is sub judice. That is a matter which is being or is about to be considered by a court. Sub judice required by section 40, 41 in schedule 6 of the Northern Ireland Act 1988 and contained in standing order 73. It provides any matters in respect which legal proceedings are active should not be referred to in committee proceedings except to the extent permitted by the committee chairperson. In such cases, the, the matter awaiting adjudication should not be prejudiced by comment um, in public session or in committee meeting. Okay, um, and I then have to make reference to the guide to the chairperson on pages 40 and 46. Guide for members in the role of functions committee are pages 47 to 48, and the public accounts committee introductory note for members at pages 49 to 52. I would now invite the clerk to highlight any key points. Thank you, um, thank you, members, uh, chair. Um, 
As I've already gone through some of the role of the PAC, I wasn't intending to, to necessarily go through that again. Um, so um, I've discussed the, the role of, of PAC, which is paragraph two. Um, this committee has nine members, uh, similar to other statutory committees in the Assembly, and the quorum um, is five, um, need to be present. Um, the committee and the committee staff, uh, we work in close partnership with the CNAG and, the, and his team. Um, and if a member wishes to raise an issue with the audit office or seek clarification on any audit issue, um, this should be raised through the committee clerk. I will go into a bit more detail about the Controller and Auditor General. Um, he is the head of the Northern Ireland Audit Office and he will be coming before this committee shortly to explain his, his, his role. Um, the status, functions and main duties of the CNAG um, and the NIO are set down in legislation um, and, he, and he is appointed for Northern Ireland by Her Majesty on the nomination of the Assembly. Under devolution, the CNAG is the Assembly's auditor. He is also described as an officer of the Assembly, which is not defined but note, denotes his role as a scrutiny partner to the Assembly, who is also independent of government, and he advises the committee as the senior independent auditor of the public sector, and his staff supports the committee as it inquires further into the findings of the report. So, just moving on to the to the Treasury Officer of Accounts. Um, as I said earlier, he um, is the representative on the government side. He is an official from the Department of Finance um, with responsibility for the issue of rules and guidance and advice to accountant officers. He attends committee evidence sessions and is formally a witness in the same way as the Controller and Auditor General is. Um, other things that he does is he coordinates and lays in the Assembly the government's memoranda of response to the committee's recommendations. Um, and that um, is done generally eight weeks after an inquiry. Um, in terms of the forward work programme, um, the committee will be reviewing the reports produced by the CNAG um, and will decide on that basis how it's going to address them in the forward work programme. So it may decide to do an inquiry or it may decide to, to deal with the issue through correspondence. But we will be dealing with the forward work programme later and that will be after you've also heard from the CNAG on what reports he's been doing um, over the past three years and also looking forward. Um, when the committee publishes its report, um, the relevant department will then address the recommendations in the MOR or the Memoranda of, of Response. Um, and as I said, that's generally eight weeks after. And at that stage, the committee will then have an opportunity to then consider that response. And that's a very important part of the <coughs> process because that's looking at whether that department has accepted the recommendations. And, and if it hasn't, why not? So it's a further stage for the committee to, you know, to, to look um, at the report <coughs> and also tie up any loose ends. Um, so other areas of work um, that the committee um, usually does is, um, as I said, the review of the MORs, um, reporting on excess votes. This is another important part of the, of the process of accountability, and that's when a department spends beyond their voted monies. Um, and generally, that would be brought to the attention of the committee through the CNAG. Um, also, consideration of ministerial directions, and that's when a minister has decided to act contrary to the advice of his or her accounting officer on spending decisions. So the committee will be notified of that as well. Um, meetings I've covered and anything else to do with meetings we can go through when we're looking at the forward uh, work programme. Um, in terms of press and publicity, there will be an opportunity to, to look at that in a bit more detail in, 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 the, in the coming weeks um, when we will be getting a briefing from the communications officer. Um, but generally what happens when, when the report um, is ready for publication, um, in terms of press release and publicity, advanced copies of the PAC report will be sent out to the press, to witnesses, uh, and to committee members up to 40 hours, 48 hours in advance, um, and that will be under strict embargo. I will remind you of all this as we, as we, as we you know, uh, go through the process. Um, 
And then the reports, the committee's reports and press releases will be available online and on social media. So that's when you know we can also you know arrange for these to be put on the likes of Twitter as well. Um, the chairperson of the committee will respond to media requests on behalf of the committee um, and will represent the agreed position or findings of the committee in, the, in, in such cases. Um, it's important to note that while a report ordered to be published by the committee attracts privilege for the purposes of the law of definition, it cannot be assumed that a press release agreed by the committee would enjoy the same protection, so it's just something to bear in mind. Um, in terms of overlap, um, PAC has first call on any of the reports by the CNA, CNAG, and what I mean by that is that obviously as it's across, it, the, the work is crosses over many departments, other statutory committees may have an interest in, in, in a particular report, but um, PAC has primacy, so that means that um, this committee makes the decision whether it wants to take a report or not, and at that point, um, it, I, as clerk, will inform other statutory committees that uh, the committee is going to undertake an inquiry, um, so that committees will be well aware of that. Um, and really, it's to avoid any overlap with other committees as well. Um, so any committee seeking to take up a matter with PAC, the normal protocol is that they, they would be required to consult with PAC. Um, and then in terms of visits, um, the committee does meet a lot in the Senate, but there's no reason why it can't also do outside visits, and it has done in the past. Um, so it has, it has visited Westminster, uh, Holyrood, uh, the House of the Erectus and the National Assembly for Wales, just depending on, 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 on what um, it is that they, they want to um, find out. Um, and it has also gone on visits in relation to committee inquiries, and I can give you a flavour of that in the legacy report, which comes next. Chairperson, if I could intervene. Uh, that's very useful because I think one important task we have is to better inform the, the general public of our work. One way to do that is to organise visits. And two that I certainly can remember clearly, one was to a school which should never have been built, but the other one was also to a school in a very working class area where astonishing improvements in educational standards were, uh, were, were achieved, and those were, were very important. Okay. Thank you. Um, just and then in terms of the last um, section of, of this paper, it just refers to the handling of committee papers um, and generally uh, papers in relation to an inquiry will be either restricted or confidential depending on the, the, the nature of, of, of the briefing. Um, and that's so that um, you know it's, it's considered by the committee it's part of the inquiry, so it's important that the classifications <coughs> um, and how they're treated should be adhered to. But again, I will explain this um, as we go through the process. Um, also, it's very important that the contents of committee reports um, are not disclosed uh, before an inquiry has concluded. Otherwise, that could preempt the findings of, of that inquiry. So again, it's just a point to, to bear in mind. Um, Hansard um, reports committee evidence sessions within three days of the relevant meeting. Um, and other than the Hansard transcript, it's, it has been the convention um, that the committee papers dealing with an ongoing investigation um, you know, are not made public until the inquiry has concluded. OK. Um, um, Right. The, the memorandum of responses are uh, quite important for the follow-up process to make sure issues have, have been addressed satisfactorily. So, so my question is, in, in terms of other committees, we're dealing with backlogs of statutory rules over the last number of years. Is there a backlog of MORs for this committee? simple answer is no. Um, most of them had been dealt with the last committee, I, I do recall there was quite a few at the beginning, and, and, and so the first few weeks were um, taken up with that. There is um, one, and I can deal with it um, when I'm doing the legacy report, but there was one inquiry in the last mandate 
where there was no MOR, be just because of how um, you know the, the timings and when the assembly stopped sitting, um, and that may be an area that the committee might wish to to follow up now, um, and I'll, I'll address that in a minute. Um, also, uh, the CNAG. Um, in his briefing, he will be referring to mm. what has happened in the last three years and what the accountability process has been in the absence of PAC. So um, I think that should um, give you some reassurances um, that, that there were mechanisms in place. Okay. Okay, members, are you content? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Item seven, sorry, item eight, um, Public Accounts Committee 2011-16 Legacy Report. If I remember the briefing papers from the audit office, pages 53 to 81 contains the audit auditors, or sorry, the audit office 2011-16 legacy report. I invite the clerk to highlight points in the report. And, uh, in the absence of legacy for 2016-70, up to members of the work of the committee during that period. Um, and also to seek members' agreement to write to the Department of Justice for an update in relation to the process regarding the committee's recommendations on managing legal aid. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Okay. Um, agenda, uh, agenda item nine, Northern Ireland Office, Audit Office first day brief. Uh, refer members to the briefing papers in Northern Ireland Audit Office, pages 83 to 120. They include uh, Northern Ireland Audit Office PAC first day brief, pages 83 to 90. Northern Ireland Audit Office public reporting program 2019-22, pages 91 to 107. And Northern Ireland Audit Office strategic corporate framework. 2018 to 21, pages 107 to 120. Uh, at this point, I would like to welcome Mr. Kieran Donnelly, CB Comptroller uh, and Auditor General, and his team, and invite Kieran to brief the committee on the role of the Northern Ireland Audit Office to put papers into context. I would also advise members that the remaining business is necessary to move into closed session. Uh, Kieran is no, no, not yet. Um, Kieran, Kyle, Pamela, you're very welcome, and I'll hand over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, just delighted to be back with the Public Accounts Committee. I'll just give you the benefit of new members, just a little bit of background about the work of what we do and how we do it. Um, I've, I've been in this role for about 10 years. Um, worked in public audit really all of my working life, so I've been involved in working and supporting Public Accounts Committee from the start of devolution and way back into the days of direct rule at Westminster. Um, Pamela beside me, she is number two, Chief Operating Officer, uh, runs the day-to-day the -day workings of the Audit Office, but she also, as a second string to her bow, she's the, the, the local government auditor. And Kyle, on this side, he's our new assembly liaison officer, and he's worked in the audit office for quite a number of years, and has been involved in many of the public reports that have come to this committee in the past. Uh, just a bit of a short uh, potted history. Um, the audit office in its current construct has been about for over 30 years. It was set up in 1987. And at that time, there were major reforms in, in public audit, and part of the idea was, was two things. First of all, to copper fasten the independence of, of, of the audit function, uh, and also to give new statutory powers to do what we call value for money audits. Um, and uh, independence is very, very important to a public auditor. Um, and I suppose the, the key to those reforms was to anchor uh, public audit in the legislative arm rather than the executive arm of, of, of government. Uh, so in a sense, I am an officer of this assembly. Uh, sometimes people out in the street will say, what minister do you work for? And I have to explain, I have no accountability line to ministers. I, my accountability is to this corporate uh, assembly. And, and that, that's very important. And uh, the legislation that came back in 30 years ago, I suppose, it, it also to the power for determining our pay and rations of, of our office away from the Department of Finance and into a special, a separate committee of this assembly known as the, the Audit Committee. So that, again, was to strengthen the, the independence. 
So that, that's enough of, about that. Uh, what do we actually do? Um, uh, I suppose uh, there's two things, basically. There's uh, the work we have to do, the statutory work, and then there's the we call it discretionary work. Uh, and understand you, I'm the, uh, I suppose the, the auditor of all public bodies, really, in, in, in Northern Ireland. We're a sense of one stop audit shop for, and that, that involves the, the, the audit of it's well over a hundred uh, accounts. Some are absolutely massive, like the, the Department of the Communities, many billions, uh, you know, other huge organisations like Belfast Health Trust, right down to small more charitable organisations. So we audit all the main uh, accounts, uh, resource accounts at central government <coughs> departments, health service accounts. Um, we'll separately we'll do the, the local authority accounts and we try to keep local government and central government the accountability uh, regime separate. Uh, there's revenue accounts, there's the accounts of all arm's length bodies. So that's our main core of our work and 60-70% of our staff are tied up in that work. Uh, the staff that work uh, in, in that area, you'll see them from time to time but not very often. They'll, they'll be working away in the background. Um, and it's only maybe if a serious issue arises in the accounts, it, it'll come in front of, I, I would suggest it will come in front of the, this committee. But of those 100 odd, 100 plus, 110 accounts, um, most of them will have, I would call it, clean opinions. Uh, but uh, every year there'll be a number, usually in single figures, of accounts where I put a qualified opinion on. Uh, some of those will be technical qualifications, uh, and there'll be always one or two more serious ones that uh, will we, we, come in front of this committee. So in the, the last mandate, uh, <coughs> we had a, a report on, on legal aid expenditure, uh, and part of that story was a, a qualified opinion on the, the legal aid accounts. So that was an example of a, a more serious one that will come to this, this committee in, in, in the last uh, mandate. Um, I see, I suppose, this, this committee as a mother of audit committees. Every public body in Northern Ireland has its own audit committee, and my staff will be around those audit committees. So if there are other audit issues and concerns at a lower level, those will be channeled through the, those audit, audit committees. If there are bigger issues, then they'll come to this committee. So that, that's the, the basic work on, on the accounts. Uh, the, the second thing then is our really our public uh, reporting program, it's mainly uh, as I mentioned earlier with value for the statutory value for money powers. Uh, but uh, there is discretion on the, the volume and amount of that work. Uh, when austerity kicked in, I suppose uh, a, no, a number of years ago, uh, we, we did have to cut our cloth. We had to do the statutory work, but uh, with probably a little bit less resource on the public reporting side. So it was very, very important that we use that resource wisely. Uh, so these days we probably produce fewer really long reports with more shorter reports and a more mixed bag of, of different types of products, that some of which will come, come to this committee. Um, you might ask, um, well, how do we decide on our public reporting program? Uh, and there are a number of things in the mix there. Uh, the first thing I would say that uh, we work within the grain of the program for government. So if you look at our program over, say, three or four years, it, it should be tackling all the main priorities in, in the program for government. So we're getting around things like uh, mental health, renewable energy, welfare reform, addiction services. We don't, we can't cover everything at once. So, but over a period of years, we get around the, the main parts of the, the public sector. Uh, so that's one thing that would drive the program. We'll also look at risks across government. There's certain types of expenditure is more risky. We had a recent report on major capital projects with certain high risk projects there that we bring out in, in public reports, areas like procurement. Uh, one of the, the big things we're looking at at the minute is uh, the capacity and capability of, uh, of the public service, the civil service. Have we got the right people, the right skills in the right place at the right time? So that, 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 that's a big one we're working on, and uh, I feel that type of issue is very important. So sometimes when things go wrong, we want to get into the underlying problems, and some of that sort of will emerge probably as well from the, the outworkings of the, the RHI inquiry. 
Uh, it's also important that we have balanced coverage across all the government departments. Some departments are bigger spenders than others, so we'll always have a fairly substantial program on health, education, justice and communities. Some of the smaller departments will not be in every year, and maybe once every, every couple of years. Other things that will drive our programme is the potential for what I call savings and financial impact, where we think there, there's genuine savings to be realised. So, for example, in the last couple of years we, we did a piece of work on the, the management of the central government office estate, and uh, there's huge potential there for savings, which we actually report in our, in our annual report. Other areas were bearing down on things like tenancy fraud, where there was major savings to bring back houses into, into public use. And not least, um, it's public interest uh, and issues that are raised by yourselves uh, and other members of the Assembly. Issues that bubble up in your constituencies, maybe where there's a, maybe there's a pattern across uh, where there are problems in public service, and sometimes you in the, you're the first to see those problems. So uh, we're delighted when, when you bring those sort of issues uh, to our attention. Uh, one thing we can't, I suppose, get into, if individuals have issues, we, we have no report in line where, where somebody has a, a particular gripe with a, the with a public service. That's for others, like the, the ombudsman. Uh, but sometimes queries would come to us and we would re redirect them in, in, in that route. Um, different types of uh, public reports. Uh, there's our mainstream value for money reports, uh, things like, uh, we'll give us stuff at the minute on addiction services, very interesting, in abuse of drugs and alcohol from a health service perspective. Uh, that's one you may be interested in in due course. But with some smaller reports in the program as well where we're trying to get a grip on, on emerging issues, uh, one of which, for example, is a strategic review of the budget process here and, and how it works. Uh, you will hear a lot of complaints about annual budgets and the lack of long-term planning. It's a big, big issue, and uh, that, that's something that features prominently in our work. Um, also, we have, um, something we created whilst the Assembly was down over the past few years is what we call impact reports. And uh, without having a PAC in place, uh, we thought it was important to track through and follow up earlier reports to make sure there's traction on them. Uh, ones that we're doing follow-ups on at the minute are special education, primary care, prescribing, those are the type of things in our program to make sure that earlier recommendations have been implemented. So uh, it's not just about doing reports, it's making sure there's actual mm -hmm. traction on them, that uh, the recommendations are... We have a good experience with government accepts, for example, well over 90% of the recommendations of this committee. That's only the first step. It's making sure those recommendations are properly and fully implemented and actually work and deal with the problems that are there to, to address. Um, it's also important that we're uniquely placed because we, we have a bird's eye view of the whole public sector across central and, and local government. So there's some topics we're very interested in that uh, straddle central and local. Uh, both Pamela and I will be working very closely together on as the time moves on, and we have one say on the planning system, how that works across central and local government, uh, and there's still an important role for the centre there uh, uh, in terms of policy and whatever. So, uh, and it's often on the interfaces between different public bodies that problems arise. So. Uh, we want to cut across the central and local space. Uh, and similarly with topics like waste management, local government is a role, but so, so does uh, central government. Uh, fine, I want to say something as well about sometimes there's a perception that auditors are critics and uh, they look for other things that go wrong. And, and yes, uh, we do point out weaknesses. But uh, we're also uniquely placed to see good practice uh, across our public sector. And uh, we don't have a separate budget for this, but sometimes if we, if we eke out a bit of resource, we, from time to time, will produce what we call good practice guides. 
Uh, they don't really come to this committee, but uh, we would launch them publicly, and they're of value to to public servants. Uh, the types of things we would have done in the past were topics like board effectiveness. Uh, we did a good practice piece on that, and uh, for um, people coming on to public sector boards for the first time, it's a good reference point. Uh, they know what sort of papers to ask for from officials and, and that sort of thing. We've done things on partnership working across government. Um, and uh, we've also won an important one coming up on just uh, getting culture right in, in the public service and looking at testing, getting the, the, the right sort of culture and uh, ethical culture across the piece. So that's a, it's a small but important part of what, what we do. Um, you might also ask, uh, what's our role in, in relation to, to fraud? Uh, I'll just say, yeah, we plan our audits, I suppose, with a reason to, to get reasonable assurance that we pick up significant material fraud. But we're not fraud investigators. That's, that's not our job. But what we do do is uh, we're keen to promote a strong counter-fraud culture across, the, across government. And initiatives we've been involved in over the years that include the National Fraud Initiative, which is data matching of different public sector data sets. That's been very useful in uh, picking up fraud, and there's been, I think, over its lifetime, probably 30 million of savings on that. Um, also, then, in a, it's worth saying we're there to support public transformation. We're not just there to critique it. Uh, 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 and uh, transformation is really, really important uh, going forward. So, uh, so uh, uh, we can do that in a way that doesn't cut across our, our independence. So one, one of the things we've been very active in is sort of, there's been a lot of work done and good work on re-engineering the relationship between government departments and arms length bodies to get that onto a good place. And we're in the middle of those conversations because often, and if we're not there, sometimes what happens is uh, there's a can't do mentality. We can't do this and we can't do that because the auditors won't allow us. And sometimes that, that's not through. So uh, um, we're as keen as anybody else to, uh, you know, to remove unnecessary bureaucracy. Uh, and that's, that, that's really important. Um, finally, I'll just say a word about uh, just accountability in the absence of, of this assembly over the past number of years. Uh, we've probably tweaked what we do to just take account of that. I already mentioned that we're doing a little bit more on follow-up reports. Uh, when the committee was there, often you would have a role in that as well and following up. Pre previous sessions, so that's something we've done. Uh, there was an arrangement, uh, I agree with the Secretary of State, uh, when the Assembly was down, that uh, my reports would be copied to the Secretary of State and the civil service then would respond to the recommendations in my reports. Uh, so that has happened, um, and in most cases, the, the recommendations have been fu fairly fully, fully accepted and uh, those uh, reports were, were really led in the, both houses at, at Westminster. Uh, so that, that's no substitute for full <laughs> democratic accountability, uh, but at least something was happening while the Assembly uh, wasn't sitting. I'll leave it there, Chair. Thank you very much. Okay. For, uh, this stage, members, yeah. any questions? You have heard this bit before, David. Yes, yeah. thank you. Yeah. You've indicated uh, most recommendations were satisfactorily dealt with. Are there any that you wish to draw to our attention? <laughs> oh, there's many things, and we're going to have a fuller conversation next week when we, we do our program. Um, it takes something like uh, where there are really deep-seated problems uh, where the fact that we make some recommendation isn't going to cure the problem immediately. We'll take one, for example. We did a big report about last year on delays in the justice system, and that was all about getting the, the PSNI, the DPP, and the judiciary to work closer together. The delays here are 
you know, quite serious, and we had planned to go back in there again. So that's something that one of the committees back you, you might wish to take take an interest in, uh, where there's been long-standing sort of deep-seated deep-seated issues. Um, I think that's uh, at a high level. You can see when you look at the program. If we've decided to have a follow-up impact study, that's us anticipating areas that maybe traction was difficult. Um, I don't think for any other reason than that. And they are complicated, cross-departmental, cross-body sort of things. So in themselves, if we were focusing on them to follow them up, it's probably something that we okay. would be drawing to your attention. Thank you. Okay. Um, Mr. Dallas. Uh, Chairperson, not, not to ask about anything historical because I'm too old for that, but uh, given that this new mandate is based firmly on openness and transparency, uh, this must be music to the Public Accounts Committee. And I ask simply the question, will there be opportunities for the committee to consider uh, changes to legislation which would improve the performance of the committee and enable it uh, uh, in many respects to uh, perhaps identify uh, issues which are developing in government departments before the, the, the horse has bolted and we don't have some of the highly embarrassing situations which happened in recent years. I think that's a, a very good question and um, there's not much point then in you know auditors coming in as you say after the the horse is bolted. Yes. Uh, so what we need to do is get in early. Now yes. we have a huge public sector. We can't be in everywhere all the time. But that was part of our thinking behind uh, a new sort of batch of shorter reports on emerging issues, uh, where we'll try as far as possible to get in quick and uh, do maybe a faster track report to the committee. But we can't be everywhere across mm. the system. The one thing I can say on, on openness and transparency, uh, I suppose we are your eyes and ears, and the one strength my team have is full access to you know the public record and uh, to documentation and I suppose one of the the issues that had come up in the last mandate is just the importance of keeping a, a good public record now I, I don't want to cut across say the you know, the RHI inquiry. I would imagine and expect whenever that inquiry reports, that's going to deal with that sort of stuff. So I would say it's their judgment until until that has happened. Uh, I can also say positively, uh, I do see with my own eyes uh, quite a bit of reform going on within internal structures in the civil service uh, and. Um, uh, and that's around things like inculcating values of openness and, and transparency and all of that. So uh, there, there is a lot of work, I think, going on behind the scenes. And I think uh, I have a, probably a more positive view of it going forward than I, I might have had uh, in the past. But uh, as you said, the, the jury is out and all of that. Uh, there have been some changes. Uh, uh, in fact, it's an event actually just happening as we speak uh, uh, at the Public Records Office. Um, I was actually doubly booked on it. Uh, but uh, <coughs> we're doing a piece of work in town with the, uh, the Information Commissioner and the Ombudsman on just promoting the whole idea of good record keeping. And uh, I think there are about 80 civil servants coming to that event uh, today. So getting the messages across. There's also good work uh, being done uh, the department DOF on the, the civil service code has been revised uh, and making it ex more, much more explicit on the requirement of public servants to keep public record because it's, it's the cornerstone of public accountability. If we don't have records, uh, you, you know, uh, there's nothing there to audit. So it's so so important. Okay. Sure, person, uh, sorry. Uh, just to, I think, uh, say I'm, I'm, I'm relieved by the answer that the controller and auditor general has given us. I've heard in the last few minutes qu quite a lot of encouraging developments, and I would ask that the Public Accounts Committee 
is kept fully informed of everything that's happening, which will improve scrutiny, uh, openness and transparency in relation to this assembly, because that <coughs> is now based on. Um, Ms. Flynn. Thank you, Chair. Um, and that was the first time I heard that presentation, <laughs> so thank you very much. I'm finding all this information really helpful, and it's lovely to meet with, with you all. Um, yeah, I was uh, when I was reading through the papers um, last night, I had noticed in some of the forward work programmes, some of the big things that was jumping out was the, the, the report around the addiction services, um, the social deprivation and links to educational um, underachievement, the mental health services and tackling social deprivation. And it makes sense now that you explained that you would sort of take some of your direction from the programme for government. Um, so I was just wondering when you're designing, <coughs> excuse me, your work plan, how would you prioritise those reports? And maybe it's a question to um, the committee clerk or the chairperson as well. Is that where you take the direction from ourselves as a committee? Or you know, do you sort of set out your own priorities? And then just a final wee question around the... Um, but it's good to see that all those issues are being looked at because they're, they're really important. Um, the, the, the work around the addiction services, it was dated 19 to 20. So would that work have already started or did you have to wait until the committee was up and running? Or? No, uh, th thank you very much for that. Just take your last point first. Uh, the work on addictions is well advanced. So we have a, a draft report that is um, out for clearance with uh, the health department. So we'd like to finalise that in the next month or so. Uh, so that uh, you know is a potential candidate for this committee. So I suppose there are two issues here: is how we prioritise our work, um, and. Uh, I'd say it's not on tablets of stone. Um, you have our three-year pro program there. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, there's one in there on uh, public service capacity and capability. Uh, that was originally in the third year of the program. We did a bit of consultation and engagement uh, with, uh, with the civil service and others on uh, on the program, and um, we're getting represent, and this is good representations, even from permanent secretaries. Could you, could you escalate that up into the sooner, mm -hmm. uh, and and that, that that that's a good thing. So, uh, the topics um, in the third year are probably not in tablets of stone. Other issues might come up in the meantime. So it's fluid and it's flexible. Uh, but then the other question is, given the. I suppose the build-up and backlog of reports is, uh, is for this committee just to decide uh, which ones that <laughs> you want to go at first. Mm. Uh, my sort of call is uh, you eventually will get round all of the, the material at some point, so it's a, it's a question of timing, uh, and uh, you know that's a, a judgment call <coughs> to, to, to where you would go. Um, I suppose. Uh, one way of looking at it, uh, take every major spending area, we probably have a couple of reports, and you say, well, you might want to say, well, what's our number one and what's our number two, you know? Yeah, so uh, there, there's a debate to be had uh, here on just uh, how you marshal those up and over um, over common period. Okay, fine. Yeah. Yeah. But I think, um, uh -huh. based, you know, Further to Karen's uh, comments, we developed this last year for the first time, a three-year plan, so that it was a new concept. And part of that was the absence of this committee being here. The other absence, to Mr. Dalt's point, was around our openness and transparency with the system as well. That we, you know, we we wanted to be open and have that engagement about what those areas are. The the topics in the 1920 programme are will be nearing completion over the next number of months, um, and the 2021s, a lot of them will have been started. But I think going forward, that's mm. the very valuable engagement with this committee around what that programme, you know, shapes up and looks like in future years as well. Mr. Hildage. Thanks, Chair. And Karen, it's good to see you again at the end of the table. Uh, no matter whether it's been the PAC or the audit committee, I always appreciate the, the strong and good sound advice that has come from your offices. So good to see you again. Uh, looking at the sort of papers in front of us there and. 
uh, 4.7, the local government panel, probably yourself. Yep. Um, for the next financial year, 21-22, mm -hmm. uh, it says local government reform. Yep. Would that be taking into account the likes of the potential savings we were supposed to see during the f yeah. we're five years down the road now? Mm -hmm. from, yeah. I know you do the audits for the councils on a we annual do. basis, but is that the type, we do. type of work you're yep. looking at for local government? Again, this in the development of this programme last year, we recognised that Ken's comment, you know, we are a one-stop audit shop. We audit all of public service. And we do have authority, um, statutory authority, to conduct value for money in local government, but hadn't exercised it. Um, so, you know, I thought programme for government across government, um, Karen's point around touch points between parts of government, we thought we should do that. So the absenteeism report in the 1920 year is the first time that we will do a central local government cross-straddling report. And then, as Karen mentioned, planning. Into the 21-22 year, our main focus is on the waste management, that second bullet point, but conversations with the department, um, exactly what you're saying. We're, you know, 2014-15 local government reform, all that goes with it, we're five years on. We thought it was a reasonable period of time to say what was the business case, what was legislatively passed, um, what has, what didn't happen, actually, to be fair, you know, aspects of service that didn't transfer and so forth, and what impact has that made? We thought it was important. The department were keen. Uh, to progress that themselves. So we have it in with a little footnote to say um, we think this should be undertaken. Uh, if the department progresses and does that in the interim period, we'll happily um, step aside from that and, and sit back and have a view on it, possibly. Um, but if, if they don't manage to sort of progress that, we will, we will target that and, and focus on it. Thank you, Lon. Well, thanks. Uh, good to see you back, Karen. Looking forward to this session. Um, and your answer to earlier about the addiction services, you mentioned that the report, the draft report, is now with the department. Um, I'm sure that's standard practice. Whatever body you're investigating or commenting on, they would have first chance to look at the draft. I presume that's just for accuracy, and that doesn't go beyond that. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, there, there's a long-standing convention that um, you know reports are cleared for factual accuracy. Yeah. Uh, 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 and the argument for that is when a report comes to this committee, you don't want the witnesses saying, I don't agree with the, the facts in the CNAG's report. Uh, so in other words, that debate should have been had before anything comes to this committee. Uh, but there's a distinction between uh, clearing factual accuracy and uh, conclusions. My conclusions are my conclusions, uh, and uh, they're, they're my own. But there could, there could be a difference of opinion about factual accuracy as well. Uh, uh, at times there could, and uh, yes. Uh, now, uh, with new protocols, actually, uh, they're not been issued, but, they're not been issued, but uh, it's something we have been engaging constructively with so. the Department of Finance, uh, and there's a number of things, is, is to get reports moving more speedily through the system. Okay. Uh, and I suppose uh, it's not uh, what we don't want is uh, every sentence and comma being, you know, scrutinised to the nth degree. Uh, we we'll do more of the clearance around the table rather than exchanges of bits of paper. So we're trying to speed up that whole process, and there's new guidance coming out from the Department of Finance that hopefully will facilitate that. I, I imagine, Chair, sure, sorry, but it'd be. You would be fairly robust with the department or uh, anybody if you thought that they were trying to have something removed from a report because they didn't like it. Uh, uh, absolutely. Uh, if they didn't, uh, there's a distinction between not liking it uh, and how do we weigh this, these issues up on the, the evidence so we follow the evidence. Uh, uh, and often if there's a deficiency in evidence, uh, you know, we'd certainly po point that out. So uh, we do, from time to time, have to be r robust in that in that theatre. Fair enough. Okay. Thank you. Um, with all members who could speak, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank um, you very much for sure. your presentation. I have to advise members that the remaining business is necessary. We have in the closed session. Uh, Kieran and his team will remain with us, if that's okay. Uh, as maybe uh, some clarification and assistance from you in relation to our forward work um, programme. 
Are members content with this? Pre ten. Okay. We close. Okay, thank you. We're now in closed session. Um, and item 10, draft forward work programme. We refer members to the draft forward work programme for January to April 2020 at page 121 to 123. Uh, and ask the clerk to brief members on the draft work programme, including the proposed visit. I want an early <coughs> visit to the audit office, which has been scheduled for Wednesday, the 12th of February. Clark. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is the um, first attempt at trying to map out the programme until... This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed.